Welcome back, friends. Recently, I had a conversation here, and I thought I, I just really needed to have a chat with you about this one. So, in visiting with this friend of mine, an old friend, he brought up a term which even sounds a little unusual when we say it out loud. He spoke about the mother congregation or the mother church or the church mother in a way that really surprised me, I guess, as, as I considered it more deeply. And I, and I thought, for the sake of this video, I would break that apart. I'm certain that there are, obvious, obviously this is an old thought. It's an old thought. It, it goes back many, many years, and I'll show that to you. But I want to show what the error is in that. Because this thought process of having a mother church, a mother congregation, uh, it's not good. In fact, the root of it is it puts you with a different God. It's no longer the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but rather a totally different God. And I, and I, I, want, to, I want to show this as I break this apart because I thought, well, I'll, I'll do a study on this. Why not? We'll go through this and see what it says. Clearly, this guy's idea was he, he used the Old Testament, which is Genesis 27. And I'll pull that up so we can take a look at that together. I'm not going to read the entire chapter. Please do. Please do. The entire chapter discusses um, Isaac blessing his children. Jacob and Esau. But for the sake of brevity, we'll, we'll cut it back to just the beginning. We'll start on verse 1, but please read the entire chapter. It makes much more sense if we do that. I, I'm just simply not going to do that. We'll start on verse 1 through perhaps verse 8, which is the key word or the key verse that needs to be discussed here in light of the mother and the authority of the mother congregation. And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, My son. And he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison. And make me savory meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah said unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat, that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, this is Rebekah speaking, Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father such as he loveth. And I'll, I'll just j skip a bit. And his mother said unto him, unto, Upon me be thy curse, my son, only obey my voice and go fetch them me. Here, there's a, a massive breakdown when this is looked at incorrectly. It's a massive breakdown in theology. Here we have the father going to bless the son and the mother rejecting that and saying, no, that's not necessary. Listen to me. Listen to me. And then you'll be blessed in place of Esau. Now, this happened. 
It truly did happen, and that's fine. But there's a reason why. And it's not that you're obedient to the mother church. That's not the point. It never was the point. Now, I I simply can't wait, I have to tell you, (laughs) that we have to back up in history. Because chapter 25 tells us the answer. Why? Why did Rebecca do this? Chapter 25, verses 22 and 23, explain it. All we have to do is read the word. God gives us the answers as to why. Uh, I'm going to read 21 also. It gives a little bit of context here. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Here's the beginning of it all. The beginning. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. This is the answer. She went to inquire of the Lord. Why are they struggling in my belly? She didn't make this stuff up on her own. She asked God. This is what we do. And what did God answer? Verse 23. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Rebecca didn't forget this. She didn't forget this. This was the plan of God from the very beginning. But it's God's plan. It's not a group of people. It's not a congregation. It's nothing else. This doesn't give complete rule to a group of people where they are above and beyond the word of God. Because clearly here what we have is normally the eldest son received the blessing. This is right and good. That's the way things were handled. Properties were passed down to be kept in the family name. The eldest son always received that property. He was always blessed that way. Well, we too are the firstborn when we are the children of God. Every one of us who is a child of God is a firstborn. But that's not technically the focus of this video, so I'm not going to go any further on that. But we are firstborn children of God. We're joint heirs with Christ. So, with that in mind, we can't use that Bible portion to support doing something different than what God would want us to do what he has asked us to do. Because Rebecca did precisely what God wanted her to do. It doesn't make her above and beyond the the father, which here the mother ruled over Isaac in this sense. Rebecca chose to do something different than what Isaac originally intended. But it doesn't work that way. The church is not the mother in that uh, ruling over and doing differently than what God the Father wants. And I don't know if that's exactly what this theology says of this congregation mother, but it certainly has to have some implication like that. Before I go to the next Bible portion, I think it's worth mentioning we should at least look at this, break it apart a little bit further. What does a mother do? If you're going to call this church your mother, what does a mother do? As a natural mother, first and foremost, they give birth. Secondly, they they nurse the child, they nourish the child, they feed it. 
and uh, take care of it all the way to adulthood. They, 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 they keep them and bless them as we see with Isaac and Jacob. They, or, sorry, um, Jacob and Esau. There's a blessing given here, and, and, and that's, that's what happens. That's what a mother does. She takes care of her ch child. She wants the best for it all its life. How does that then relate if we're going to try to make this mother the church? Well, then this, this mother, this congregation, this group of people would be giving birth to you. Now, now you're born of a group of, 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 a, of an entire group. And, and that's, that's what now keeps you in the faith. Um, quite an interesting theology. If you break that apart, you're fed, nourished, nursed by this congregation. What an interesting thought that whatever comes out from this congregation is what is your food. And that's where you find food. That's where you get your food. That's what, that's, it is your food. Really interesting thought. Also foolish. Let's look at what the scripture says. I, I know there's one other Bible portion that Galatians chapter 4 is going to be used in this. There's no question about it. And, and it comes from the allegory of, of the law. And maybe I should go there right now to, to show what this looks like. Again, it's, it's a complete fallacy. It's, it, it's looking at it wrong. And then we'll go back to what, how we are actually born and nourished and fed and nursed and, and what is it that nurses us and feeds us and keeps us? So we'll go to Galatians 4. It's going to be 21, I believe. Paul is giving this allegory. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Right here, we start seeing some massive inconsistencies if we're going to look at a physical mother giving birth. One is born of the flesh, the other is of promise. This is precisely what happened with, with uh, Rebecca. Abraham's first son, this is what this allegory is about. Abraham's first son was born of a bondwoman prior to circumcision. The second son was born of a promise. At f he was the first child after circumcision. This was, Abraham had been circumcised that's the very first person born of a circumcised man. It's, it's an interesting thought to, to tie in here. Starting on verse 24, or continuing on verse 24, which things are in allegory or symbol, symbolic? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travaileth, 
travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Why is Paul giving this allegory? It's because we're not in bondage under the law. It's not a physical thing here. You're born of the promise, which is the entire point when we go back. If, if you're born of a congregation, I don't know what you're actually born of. But when you're born of the promise, what is the promise? Do we, do we, want, do we want to go back to Genesis 3.15? That's the first time we see the promise. That's where it's at. Let's, let's do that. Because it's so easy to just see what the promise is. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's the promise. That's never changed. And who is the person in this promise? The seed of the woman. It's Jesus Christ who is the promise. So if you're born of this new Jerusalem, which is the mother of us all, then you are born of Jesus Christ because he's the only one that came down from heaven. Now, I'm willing to have the discussion on the word also came down from heaven. But Christ is the word. I'm totally fine with that. And of course, we can prove this. I'm more than happy to go there too. We'll, we'll, we'll go to John chapter 1, verse 1. This, this is as clear as can be. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. We don't need to separate the Word and Jesus Christ because they are one and the same. Christ is the visible Word, the Word, the, the, the word of God, the promise of God. This is what the Word is. And in essence, it's also the gospel. So, to take the word and be born of that, this begins to make a lot of sense. If, if your birth is of the word, it's of the promise, promise again being Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. First uh, Peter, let's go there. Um, one twenty three. Here's here's what God tells us, who we're born of. He doesn't say it's a group. He doesn't say it's a congregation. Here's these are the words of God Himself, as revealed through Peter, by the Holy Ghost. Believe this. Don't don't go believing some man. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. See this? Which liveth and abideth forever. What lives and abides forever? Well, it's Jesus Christ and it's the word. That's what we're born of. So,
I'm also thinking about John chapter 1. I'm going to go back there. Verses 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That's those that received Jesus Christ, the word. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Which, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of man, of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Nowhere is it telling you you're born of a group. Nowhere is it telling you you're born of a congregation or a church or whatever you want to call it here, an, an assembly. It just doesn't do it. Now, if, if, this being fed by the congregation, this nursed, nourished by the congregation was valid, it would only be if this congregation or church is remaining in the word and offering the word of God, the gospel, to all mankind. So that gospel, what is, what, this, this becomes valid if, if what is preached is Jesus Christ and him crucified. So we can see this if we go to, um, to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And I think it's worth mentioning, well, there, there's a lot here. I, I'm gonna go to Timothy. I'm gonna go to 2 Timothy because I think this, this helps to flesh it out and then I, then I wanna go to John also, chapter six. 2 Timothy chapter three, Verses 14 and 15. I know I'm going to get a little long on this, but this is, a, this is a really weird topic if it's not fleshed out properly. What does Paul tell Timothy here? If you want to understand what it is that saves you, if you want to be nourished, if you want to be kept in the faith, he tells him, starting on verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This it's the word that nourishes you. Now, now I want to go to John because I think he says it so beautifully and realistically the entire chapter 6 ought to be read here because there's no way that I can cover even a fraction of what he says here in this chapter. I'm going to go to uh, verse 32. Ah, uh, through 35. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Once again, what came from heaven? Christ. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. This is the new Jerusalem which came down from heaven above. There's no other way around it. What nourishes and feeds you? The bread of life. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Again, I'm way over time already. I'm going to just let this go. Read the entire chapter. You'll see the bread of life through, throughout this entire chapter. Um, throughout this entire chapter, it, it, is, it is 
truly amazing. I'm, I'm going to also go to the seventh chapter of John, 37 and 38, because he just mentioned being nursed by this water of life. In the last day, that day, great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. How can you, how can you miss this? How can you miss this? It's Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, which dwelt among us. Now, of course, I'm going to read the 20, uh, 39th verse just because. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they had, they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. He's speaking of this living water being the Holy Ghost. And that it's in you. And that it flows from you. You'll never thirst. There's out of your belly will flow living waters. It continues. I'm not going to go into greater detail. Again, read the entire chapter. This is, this is really good reading. But before I end, I want to go to 1 Peter The first chapter, the first five verses, because I, if you want to be kept in the faith, the faith of Jesus Christ, here's how we do it. But Peter, in some ways, explains all of it. Everything that we've covered today, he, he puts it into five verses. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again. What's begotten? It's to be born of. He be, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. By, that's a living hope here. It's a living hope. Eternal life is involved in this. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the important aspect, friends. That's where it's at. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You're kept by the power of God. And as I mentioned earlier, Paul tells us the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. What is the gospel? Once again, it's the good news. What's, what good news did we have? That the promise was fulfilled and that promise is Jesus Christ. I'm going to leave you with a little bit of a historical context. I recognize, I don't know which denomination any of you are, but remember that this is not a new concept and it goes far back beyond where this is. But I'm going to read a, a point I wrote down from the Council of Trent, which was written in April 8th of 1546. But only the church is able To interpret the Bible and tradition, so the same session decreed this Council of Trent. No one relying on his own skill shall in matters of faith and morals pertaining to the sanct edification of Christian doctrine, <coughs> excuse me, using the scriptures to his own senses or resting the scriptures to his own senses, presume to interpret the same sacred scripture contrary to the sense of which Holy Mother Church, whose it is to judge of the true sense and interpretation of the Holy Scriptures, hath held and doth hold. 
the Council of Trent in 1546 put together this session to rebut the Protestant Reformation, which held, and, and obviously the key principles of the Protestant Reformation are these, that it is by grace alone, by faith alone, by the merit works of Christ alone, by scripture alone, and all glory to God alone. In this way and in this way only is one justified, made righteous before God. The Council of Trent in 1546 said that is simply not true. You have to come through us, the Holy Mother Church. So there's a precedent. But it's a failure. Because that precedent places the Holy Mother Church in the place of God. And it becomes a different God. And I don't want you to have a different God. I want you to believe the God of the Bible, the God of the scriptures. Believe him. Because he's the one with the promise. And he's the one that fulfilled the promise through his son. And in that and that alone, this is how we find salvation in the scriptures, by believing the word of God. As it tells us in Romans chapter 4, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. You're not going to have this righteousness counted to you if you're believing a group, the Holy Mother Church, or the Mother Congregation, or whatever you call it today. The only way to receive this salvation and true peace is in Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life. Believe the word, dear friends. And with that, God bless you all and see you next time.